Commercial work. Okay, redo. Um, you want to come on? Yes, please. Okay, okay great. So, okay. Um, I am featuring a special guest today, so he's just got here. Oh. It's going to be cool. All right. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jared Johnson, and today I'll be presenting to you, I'm so excited to present to you on Fan Debt and Florence Price, um, the personal lives and piano works of 20th century composers of the African diaspora. Nathaniel Ted, 1882 to 1943. Here's a picture of the place um, where Nathaniel was born, in Niagara Falls. Um, um, his mother was Charlotte Washington Dead, Canadian. His father was Robert Dead, an American. It's known that the mother, Charlotte Washington, her family migrated up north through the Underground Railroad. Um, the family was intelligently, um, oh my gosh, I'm messing my words up, educated and musically inclined, and Nathaniel was able to read by and play by ear by the age of five. He played at local churches to make money, and also the Cataract Hotel um, as a bellboy. And he had an extreme interest in his awakening kind of came when he went to Oberlin College. He went to Oberlin College, and this is where he first hears Antonio Dvorak and some of his New World symphonies and also um, compositions by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who is an African um, British composer. Okay. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Nelson Mandela said that. Pictured and shown here is Elite, Helen Elise Smith, his wife, who was also known as, um, in kind of her claim to fame was being the first black graduate of Juilliard, which was known as the Dan Rush Institute of Musical Art in 1907. Um, a brief timeline of some of Nathaniel Dent's accomplishments were, in 1908, he graduates from Overland College in 1913. He becomes the choir director at Hampton Institute, which is in Hampton, Virginia. Um, shout out to Virginia. Uh, the couple raised two daughters, and he began to just really seek a lot of educational opportunities um, from completing his master's at Eastman and getting doctorate degrees from Howard and in Overland. In 1926. Um, one thing I found really particularly interesting was that Hampton is known as a historically black college and university. It was founded in 1868, yet he becomes the very first music department chair in 1926. So um, that's just kind of telling as about, you know, the origins of some of our HBCUs that um, they have a really strong um, root in things that are sometimes not necessarily black. A composer. I think they have the video. Yes. Oh, no sound. Oh, no. Does it have speakers or? I have no clue. If you want to turn it up with the remote, that might do it. Okay. Well, maybe you could click the... Despite his yeah. record as a piano teacher, Nathaniel Dent is best known for his musical compositions, most of which were piano and choral pieces, like Antonin Dvorak of Czechoslovakia and Richard Wagner of Germany. Dent drew upon the folk songs of his ancestors, immortalizing the African-American spirituals of his people with ink and paper. Dent succinctly summarized the philosophy behind his crusade to transcribe the oral melodies of Black Americans in the title of a 1918 essay that he wrote for Hampton University, The Emancipation of Negro Music. He elaborated upon this philosophy in The Emancipation, writing, We have this wonderful store of folk music, the melodies of an enslaved people. But this store will be of no value unless we utilize it, unless we treat it in such a manner that it can be presented in choral form in lyric and operatic works, in concertos and suites and salon music, unless our musical architects take the rough timber of Negro themes and fashion from it music which will prove that we too have national feelings and characteristics, as have the European peoples whose forms we have zealously followed for so long. Throughout the course of his life, Dad published around 100 compositions. These included 46 choral works, 23 vocal solos, 12 piano solos, five piano suites, two collections of spirituals, and one oratorio. Okay, 
So Depp knew the importance um, of writing music for profit, putting it down on um, paper, you know, which was something that a lot of musicians prior to that weren't doing. They were having these wonderful pieces, but kind of not giving the credit for them or the compensation. He is one of the first black composers in the early years of ASCAP, um, which is one of the founding members, Harry T. Burley. And one prominent thing about that is he believed in honoring the typical spirituals that had been there in slave songs, but he wanted to kind of utilize original themes, not copy and paste or expound upon um, themes that had already been done. So that was a really unique thing about his, his flair. Um, we talked briefly um, in this class, well not briefly, but extensively about Will Marion Cook's New York Syncopated Orchestra, and they played a lot of his, his works as well. Um, his works, and he actually was able to play as a pianist at Carnegie Hall and Boston Symphony Hall. Um, and finally, there's a poet by the name of Paul Lawrence Dunbar who was pretty prominent in, in the earliest, early 20th century. And Det loved his poetry so much that he actually composed um, some of his compositions too and set to that poetry. Um, so today you're going to hear a little bit about that and you're going to hear that, how it kind of lines up with the music that he wrote with the poem. The spike is long. Okay. In the bottoms, characteristic suite for the piano um, is a suite of five movements, each uniquely delivering vivid imagery and dignified feelings specific to Negro life in the river bottoms of the deep south. Um, he wrote what he knew. We all typically write and express the things that we knew. And so he takes this characteristic suite in 1913, which is when he also first started as a professor at Hampton. Um, Ditt states that just as it is quite possible to describe the traits of people without using the vernacular, so it is similarly possible to musically portray roles and peculiarness without the use of national tunes or folk songs. Okay, so that kind of speaks again to his originality. Um, this is a programmatic work, and it has five movements. Prelude, his song, Honey, Barcarolle, and the dance, which is called a juba. So just briefly to discuss the five movements. Um, the prelude is called Night, that's its other name, and it describes with the open fists um, throughout the piece, it kind of just kind of illuminates the open sky, a vast open sky that ties back to the heritage of the sky in Africa and the night sky here in America. Um, the second movement is his song, and his song describes the character of an older man sitting on his front porch humming and um, the tune of that hum <laughs> the character depicted in the second movement is an elderly black man who sits and hums an improvised tune likely a spiritual or a hymn for hours on a quiet evening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He illuminates a sense of calm, peaceful gratitude, despite living in a world of oppression and depression. He conveys the strong resilience of black people through this and the hearts. Um, some people have considered it to sound a little bit like nobody knows the trouble I've seen, but Det denies that and says that his songs are completely original. Um, the third movement is entitled Honey, and it alludes to Southern pleasantries, um, a term of endearment. Depending on the context, honey can mean any number of things, um, from a flirtatious nature or from just a simple, oh, watch out, honey, you know, excuse me, honey, or uh, something nice as a way to call and refer to people. Um, the fourth movement is mourning, um, and it's a barcarolle, which follows the typical um, statements of barcaroles of um, Chopin and, and Beethoven and the rest of them. Um, in the European tradition, I should say, um, inclu including predominant harmonies of sixths and thirds. And uh, finally, the Juba Dance. Juba Dance is based on syncopated rhythms of the antebellum folk dance, Pat and Juba. What that means is on the plantation, in order to keep themselves entertained and sometimes to entertain their slave owners, um, and then honestly to just pay homage to their own origins, they would do what we call kind of a body percussion, if you will, um, with foot tapping, hand clapping, 
thigh slapping, and intricate rhythmic patterns. So the basic pattern, and here's where you all get to participate a little bit today, the basic rhythm is just And so that's the rhythm. And I want you all to kind of, I see some of yeah, your last Jordan already starting to come, come in. Fill in, right? You all know rhythms and stuff like that. Just let it fit. And it can also be on top of that or just mixed in any type of improvised rhythms. On top of that rhythm would be um, fiddlers and banjo players kind of just improvise the melody. So we're going to try that when I do play the juba just a little bit. Um, yeah, so let's try it real quick. We'll get a quick practice in. So here's the beat. <laughs> Please enjoy the reimagining of In the Bottoms Characteristic Piano Suite. We're going to be playing and featuring the third and an excerpt of the fifth movement today. And I will invite to you now Poet Laureate Sir Isaac. So we're, it's 1913, uh, Savannah, Georgia. We're in the marketplace, okay? We're with our favorite Negro. He's with his friend telling him a story about last night. And he just got new shoes. Now, the market's a little busy, and he doesn't want anyone to step on his new shoes. So, jump back, honey, jump back. See my lady home last night. Jump back, honey, jump back. Held the hand, squeezed the tie. Jump back, honey, jump back. Hud a side, a little side. See the light gleam from her eye. <laughs> and the smile go flitting by. Jump back, honey, jump back. Heard the wind blow through the pine. Jump back, honey, jump back. Mockingbird was singing fine. Jump back, honey, jump back. My heart was beating so when I reached my latest door that I could not but to go. Jump back, honey, jump back. Put my arms around her waist. Jump back, honey, jump back. Raised her lips and took a taste. Jump back, honey, jump back. Love me, honey. Love me true, love me well, is I love you? <laughs> and she answered, Cause I do. Jump back, honey, jump back. So um, many of the black composers of the 20th century kind of went unnoticed, uncelebrated, and um, died, you know, significantly poor, or were not able to receive their just due until, you know, after they were dead. But I think the, the typical pattern that we notice here is that um, copy and paste was real before copy and paste was real. And so this just kind of shows and highlights the timeline of different composers who we all know, and many people who study music are familiar with Gollywog's Cakewalk, 
um, but they're still trying to, you know, fashion where those sounds kind of originate from. There's Debussy is over in Europe, and the Cakewalk is obviously a song that kind of highlights themes that were very American and born here. Um, similarly with uh, Florence Price and her symphony in E minor, which was in 1933, and many people did not know that piece until about 2009 or so because it was lost and it was hidden or tucked away. Um, but everyone knows and is very familiar with Porgy and Bess. Okay, so just a pattern there. Brings me to Florence Price. Born in 1887 and died in 1953. All right, here's a picture of Little Rock, Arkansas, where, where Florence was born in the late 1800s. Her father and mother were a very prestigious black family. They were the family kind of just iconic. Her father was a dentist who had a very vast practice and actually uh, was also an artist and an inventor. He premiered a lot of his artwork and his inventions in Chicago World Fairs and things throughout um, the country. And his mother was a, and her mother was a very prominent businesswoman uh, from Indiana. Unfortunately, a fire came about and they had to migrate from Chicago down to Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, they were still obviously coming from Chicago down to Arkansas, seen as still a very prominent family. Um, they were the epicenter, if you could just imagine, really, really super high class in that time period. Shown here are two of Florence Price's fine educators. You'll notice I love to highlight education because I love to learn. Um, I love to teach, I love to just find out new facts. So, um, and it's important to give teachers their, their just due as well. Charlotte Stevens is shown here and she taught Florence during her early years, her development years. And shown on the left is George W. Chadwick. Um, interesting fact about him, um, he's one of the founding members of <clears throat> Find Me Alpha Fraternity, which is an organization that I'm a part of. It's a music fraternity founded in 1898. And so it's interesting doing my research, finding out that he was one of Florence Price's close um, mentors and encouraged her to compose and kind of took her under his wing as like a one-on-one -on -one student. You know, she was that promising. Uh, Florence attended Boston's New England Conservatory, just like our very dear Dr. Carter. And at age 16, she was a music ed and, double ma and a double major as organ. Um, people are somewhat familiar. How many of you are familiar with William Grant Steele? Okay, William Grant Steele was also taught at the same time by Charlotte Stevens. She taught for over 70 years, which is incredible. Um, I can't even imagine teaching that, but of course I'm sure she <laughs> has. Uh, you know, a, an incredible amount of students over those 70 years that <clears throat> were able to um, learn from her. Why is the privacy is gonna fall? <laughs> Why? I'm not done, and we're gonna decolonize everything. Then you're good. <laughs> right. Um, as said very eloquently by India Moore, white supremacy is gonna fall one day. Here is a slide that is kind of dedicated to <clears throat> some of the instances that directly influenced and affected Florence Price in her music, in her life as a black woman, as a composer. Um, and it's not without these things that <clears throat> we can consider how far she made and what she had to go through. So in 1891, Florence Price is only four years old at this time. And if we can imagine the Reconstruction era, immediately after slavery in 1865, um, things and conditions were really, really good for African Americans in some parts. The Union soldiers were still present in the South um, and not allowing um, uh, the Confederates to kind of bother or mess with. This is when we see the rise of black politicians, governors, congressmen. This is when we see, um, like Florence Price's father, you know, the ability to be a black businessman, having white um, patients and things like that for him to be very lucrative. So unfortunately in 1891, disgraced President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy returns home and says, well, since I couldn't run the whole United States, I can at least run my state. And we're gonna start changing some things. So they take down the picture of George Washington and in comes da, 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 Jim Crow, uh, where he begins to just institute all kinds of laws saying separate but equal segregation. So now uh, Price, uh, excuse me, Smith, Dr. Smith, which is Florence's father, is not allowed to have his patients. So his business 
low-key kind of fail because the crumbles, it crumbles. And that's affecting their whole livelihood. Before that happens, though, here's a newspaper article. And I'm just going to read you one line of that. This is highlighting the fact that Frederick Douglass, a celebrity of the day, the most photographed man of the 19th century, um, swagged out. He came to visit um, Arkansas and he stayed in the price, in the Smith's home, right? Um, so it says, Dr. Smith is a colored man, but with so complete a polish in manners, dress, language, and appearance that he may be truly called a Negro in name only. Yeah, right? Kind of insulting um, yeah. on, a, on a huge level. And these are just publications that are published um, throughout. And then finally, the really big ticking time bomb for um, Florence Price to just end up leaving Little Rock and migrating up north, which is what many people of the South did in the early 1900s, was a brutal lynching of John Carter. Klansmen literally dragged his body through the town by a car. Um, broke into the church and used the furniture as firewood and then used his charred, broken off arm to conduct traffic. So that brutal lynching encouraged her to pack up her things and get the heck out of Arkansas. Price family's move to Chicago's South Side provided Florence with a much richer artistic climate. Chicago was just kind of the place to be in the late 1920s and late 1930s. So there was a very large African-American community, very vibrant community. It was a very rich cultural scene at the time, and she was just embraced as soon as she got to Chicago. So yes, her career took off. Okay, um, everybody is pretty aware of the Harlem Renaissance, correct? We all have heard of that and um, all the great things that were going on. But there was also a big boom in Chicago um, where Florence Price begins to just achieve a lot of success and she's concentrated in this area of talent and promise and um she's there with her husband and two daughters um and it kind of just really takes off for her she's doing well but in the wake of this and her doing very well um her husband's move was it was not as lucrative for him he did very well down south in little rock so you can imagine tensions going on with um work and relationship and marriage um yes all right, she works hard for the money. <laughs> Newly divorced from jobless, abusive Tom Price, um, she begins to have to make money to support her daughters. And so she wrote and published popular pieces and would um, send them in and get cash um, for various ensembles, whether it's solo piano, um, orchestral uh, compositions, which is what she first entered into a Winnaker contest. Um, also, small ensemble pieces such as string quartets. Um, and another side job for her was the silent film organist um, for white theater. So they would keep her kind of in the dark um, so that she wasn't seen, but she was allowed to play the music for that because she was phenomenal. Um, so all these odd jobs kept her kind of employed, yet not necessarily very rich. Um, she wins her very first prize in a symphonic category, $500 for her symphony in E minor. You know, back then, I guess that was, you know, that was a solid amount of money. In 1933, um, she became the first woman to have a composition played by a major orchestra, the Chicago Symphony. Um, let's see. Um, okay, these notes are a little mixed up. All right. Um, Juba and Fantasy Negro number one. Most of Florence Price's compositions in general, specifically her piano compositions, acknowledge her ancestral roots through compositions for black listeners. Um, it's one thing to have her European tradition and training. She was very finely trained, but she's noticed that for the people that she wanted to play for and the audiences she was allowed to play for in public, they weren't necessarily responsive to a lot of that literature. So what she did was kind of marry her culture to that technique and provide a very beautiful, elegant uh, form of music that had not been done before. All right. Um, she incorporates established spirituals in her compositions, kind of opposite of Nathaniel Dett, who believed in doing original work. 
Um, and so, and for instance, one of them in her concert overture number two, she features the song Go Down Moses, which is a very popular Negro spiritual. Um, in it, she utilizes what we call the pentatonic scale, um, <clears throat> which is simply in, in minor. Kind of that, that general sound that just feels um, very uh, passionate. Um, and finally, Don't Let This Harvest Pass is the spiritual which she uses to embody Fantasy Negra number one. So I'm going to play the main theme of that at this point. to elaborate a lot that song that piece actually is 10 minutes long and she takes that melody and just throws in chromaticism wonderful chords switches the melody left hand and right hand it's extremely difficult but it is a really really wonderful piece um hold fast to dreams so i'm going to talk very briefly about dreams we know linton hughes he wrote a poem called dream deferred and what happens to a dream deferred does it drive like a raisin in the sun um, things like that. But he wrote another one called Hold Fast to Dreams, which Florence particularly liked and composed a song to it. So if I could get a volunteer to read for me Hold Fast to Dreams, I would like you to participate. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen in snow. Um, so Florence, despite all of her success um, that she was having in Chicago, she had one really big dream, and that dream was to have her pieces played by the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which is where she went to college, and um, she really wanted that. You know, we all have our, our dreams that we really want, but this, and sometimes that causes us to be you know, less receptive of the other recognition that we're getting. So she went on and on to try to write letters to that, that director saying, please, you know, would you listen to my pieces? Would you work for my pieces? And then uh, maybe consider playing them. Yet she never received a response. In that same letter, it's a little discouraging because she apologizes for her race and gender, um, labeling them handicaps, and says if she was not handicapped with being a black woman, that more than likely her compositions would have easily recognized and been recognized. So that's a little bit of just kind of attesting back to the um, couple slides ago about what that mentally does to a person, um, um, racism in general. <clears throat> Yet and still, even though she never acquires that particular goal, that her really big breaking moment is um, in 1933 where she is premiering her symphony in E minor. The newspapers are there, the press is there, everybody is there, and just continue to note how American her compositions sound. Um, they, they notice her thematic and harmonic de development and her technique with her Gentile manner. Um, here's a program of that event. And also, if you'll notice, we have another familiar name, Roland Hayes, from our, our previous discussions in class. She was also featured on television, the early forms of television back in 1933 and 1940. Um, and then she has a school named after her as well. Um, so, I was gonna say, just let it flow, I left the L off. Anyway, just let it flow. The Philadelphia Orchestra recently recorded a performance featuring two of her published symphonies. Um, the recording is nominated for the 22 Grammy Award. So from 1953, when she passes, to 2009, her scores were actually kept in an attic. And um, they were not really heard of or seen for such a long time until a couple discovered them. And when they did, you know, they began to just clamor over them and 
um, send them to different places and people and study them. There's a children's book that was published by her about uh, published about her last November as well. So I think at this point she's finally getting a lot of just do. More people are talking about her. More people are obviously presenting about her, and it's just really a, a, a good feeling. Uh, special thanks and acknowledgments. That concludes my presentation for today. Um, thank you all. This inaugural class of the African American Musicology course at Georgia State. I'm very proud um, to be in this class because it just gives me a, a full feeling, an affirming feeling that I don't think I've ever had as a musician, as a student musician at any point in my life. And um, so I'm very grateful for this class. And, uh, Dr. Carter as well. So here are some of my sources and that concludes my presentation. Outstanding. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank wow, you. wow. Really well done. Wow. Yes. Thank you so much.